and welcome to the Crypto Queen Show. Just my little disclaimer that I do not endorse any specific project, blockchain, corporation. I'm here to raise awareness in the cryptocurrency space, educate, and the awesomeness that is in the blockchain technology and the digital asset space. So anything you hear today is not financial advice, and always do your own research. So I'd like to welcome Maya and her husband, Chris, from Fruition Productions, Fruition Films. So um, I've invited them here today because they're creating a documentary around XRP and I think it's really important to have the XRP community on board with what you're creating, Maya. So I know there's going to be a lot of questions for you today, but I thought we might just start with Chris, giving a little bit of background um, on who you are, Chris. Um, I know that you studied in Seattle and you've moved to LA to progress um, your career in the film industry, but maybe you want to speak a little more around that. Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, Hi, so basically we spent, you know, the last couple of years uh, producing commercial content here in Los Angeles, and I had spent, prior to uh, making, you know, this project, we had done a couple of smaller film projects last year, a short film, a couple of short films in, in sort of prep. And prior to that, I spent almost a decade at Google um, doing go-to-market marketing and um, doing uh, strategy and operations there. So <clears throat> kind of going full circle, coming back to Los Angeles, sort of restarting, not restarting career, but moving towards the goal of actual filmmaking, storytelling, and where better to do it than uh, on a topic that Maya and I are both passionate about, which is uh, crypto space, uh, an area that we've been in um, for a number of years. And an area where I feel like there isn't a lot of high quality documentaries being made. When we looked around at the the space, we were sort of disappointed by either the caliber, the quality, uh, and or the seriousness, along with the focus being mostly in Bitcoin, which is nothing wrong with Bitcoin, but it's just sort of, that's the entry point for a lot of folks into crypto. And we thought, you know, the XRP Army is a very strong community, is a part a community we're a part of that Maya's done a lot of work to, to, to talk with and to build relationships inside of. So we wanted an opportunity to make a high quality documentary that, that explores the space and explores, you know, not just the lawsuit, which is certainly an interesting topic, but the future of crypto technology um, using the XRPL um, blockchain. So that's kind of a, like a brief synopsis. Okay, great. Thanks. So I, I've got lots of questions myself because um, I know that when you started out with um, the documentary, you were focusing on the lawsuit and the Hinman emails. So what what was it that instigated you in starting the documentary really, like in a little bit more detail? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we just answered that. Basically, we looked around the space uh, we, we never started the documentary uh, on the purpose of the Hinman emails. We actually started with just the immediate people that Maya knew. She had been active in those spaces, and she can speak to the spaces she was, you know, discussing uh, with various parts of the XRP Army, uh, what, what's going on in the space. And again, we were looking around at all of the documentaries and all of the storytelling, and we just felt like there wasn't a high-quality documentary that was made specific to XRP, specific to this storyline of uh, describing you know, what, what it is to a broader audience. I think a lot of people who are in X, a lot of people who are in TikTok or other platforms, they already have the question. They're already bothered by something. They want to know more about this crypto technology. Therefore, they're finding people like you or they're finding other channels to go get information from. But we really want to raise the awareness because I think all of us have had the experience when you go out to a family function, you talk to friends, neighbors, other folks, there's still a tremendous amount of number of people who don't know very much about crypto. I, I experienced this myself inside of, uh, even inside of Google, which, you know, a center of tech, uh, a lot of folks had a cursory uh, understanding of, of what crypto was, and therefore we wanted to make an opportunity to raise the awareness and build a high quality story that showcases all of the various use cases, all of the trauma that's gone through with the lawsuit. And where are we going to go after that? That's kind of the, the piece of that. I don't know, Maya, if you want to add anything about the XRP Army or your involvement prior to our documentary. Yeah, yeah, I can add. Um, so, yeah, I've been um, 
in the space on TikTok and just X for a number of years since really 2020. Um, kind of, so, um, kind of, uh, you know, just built, started building relationships and started understanding that, like, like my husband said, um, you know, people really had that question, um, as to, you know, even just not even in regards to XRP or Ripple or that technology, but just where's this digital world going, right? And, um, you know, at least when we got into the space back in like 2017, 18, you know, there weren't a whole lot of uh, even influencers or people to really reach out to or listen to in the space. And ultimately, I really, from my perspective, I really wanted to... Um, educate people on a broader spectrum um in the space you know not just in the space but also even individuals who are in the financial world of like stock market or new blue you know they know they're educated in blue stock and all of that but they don't yet know anything really about the digital aspect um to where the world's going and i i truly believe this is a hist historical moment i know that um, I feel like with the XRP community as well as crypto, it is kind of the gateway to into this new financial world. So um, I I do think it's valuable um, for people to know. Um, so yeah, that's just kind of a little bit of my uh, thinking in regards to why we decided to make it. Yeah, thank you, Maya, and thanks, Chris. So um, you mentioned Maya that you've been in the cryptocurrency space since 2020. I think, Chris, you might have indicated that you've been in, in the space longer. But I'm just wondering, like... Yes, um, really, so that was just kind of the TikTok social media space. Obviously. Yeah, so obviously you are XRP holders, would that be correct? Yes. So yes, yes. Can, I, can I ask sort of when you came into um, buying XRP... And, and kind of how long you've actually been in the XRP community? Yeah, yeah. Um, really, it's been since uh, about November of 21. Um, we were, before that, we were invested in, you know, we first start out, started out with like Bitcoin, which everyone, that's the entry point, right? And then moved on to um, some other kind of uh, Projects and technologies, you know, Solana, Cardano, um, Ethereum. We we actually um, did figure out. My husband helped. Uh, he figured out a way to like build miners. We mined for a while, um, and then uh, sold when Ethereum 2.0 came out in 21, 22. But really, it was kind of like the Wild West back then, you know. Like um, it was hard to get accurate information, and you just kind of had to go with you know, kind of an eclectic uh, view of things where you had to borrow from different people's viewpoints as well as, you know, their facts um, and make a decision yourself. And uh, then we started, and then we ended up in 2020 to 21, got into Dogecoin, uh, did that whole thing when Elon Musk, right, came in uh, to SNL and uh, pumped Dogecoin, did fairly well, then we decided to get into Shiba Inu at that point because I was in the space so much that I think at the time, uh, Chris, you were kind of just uh, in the Google world and working and, you know, I would tell you different things. So, um, but he got more and more into it and invested as time went along, but um, really went from Bitcoin to Dogecoin to Shiba and then into XRP. Um, just understanding that really now it's, you know, a lot of what's driving uh, a lot of these projects is utility. Um, so I would never go back to, you know, the meme coin era. It was definitely an interesting time. But Chris, do you have anything to say on that? No, I don't have anything to add to that. Um, Devon, you had a question? Go for it. Uh, yes. Can you guys hear me? Anyway. Okay, I want to say thank you to you guys as well because uh, anything XRP related, I'm definitely in full support. So I wanted to say thank you to you guys for coming through and taking the time to tell us. Um, 
what it is that you guys are doing so much. Uh, can you hear me? Can she not hear me? Can you hear? Um, yeah, Javon we can hear you. Can I? We can hear you. Yeah. Oh, okay. So we can uh, hear you. I just can't yeah, hear I just had on. A... Chris, can you hear Devon? Yes, I can. I'll okay. just focus my question towards Chris then. So yeah. Can you hear me? Yep, I got you. Go for it. Okay. Yeah, so uh, is it safe to say that the intention behind creating this uh, documentary is to like share the experience from the XRP community and our point of view from what happened to us in the lawsuit? Like, what is the intention behind the, uh, the documentary? Yeah, sometimes I think about this like, uh, like, how do I talk to my mom about crypto? You know, and I, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I mean, like, how do we make something that is both educational and like made at a production level that could appear on a streaming platform that could educate a wide audience but also like keep them captivated right because uh, a lot of a lot of education is also entertainment like a lot of what's out there in the space it's not not to diminish the value of it but you have to make it you may have to make it very captivating so I, I think the goal of the project is really to drive awareness to the XRP uh, technology, drive awareness for folks. They, they should come out of this documentary not knowing, uh, if they didn't know anything about it, they should come in and think, wow, this is a really interesting technology, and I want to know more. I want to go out to X or out to TikTok or YouTube or wherever, and at least look up one of these people, be it John Deaton, Jimmy Valley, be it one of the many, many influencers we have, and go find the information for themselves, and at least at minimum have like you know, an enjoyable experience learning about that. So I think, in essence, I'm answering your question as a yes. We want to drive awareness into the XRP community, but also, like, provide a positive banner for people who may not know anything, or maybe all they know is negative. Maybe you've heard about a court case. Oh, yeah, that's that one crypto that, like, like the law is, like, going to come after. Uh, good luck with that. Like, we want to debunk these things, especially as we know that that case, you know, only has so many more steps left in it. And as, as we know that, the, you know, the uh, incoming um, addition of big capital, you know, all the ETFs and other catalysts such as the halving are creating a quite an exciting time, I think, in crypto once again. But this time around with legitimate use cases, not just uh, building NFTs on, you know, digital assets, which isn't bad. But I think this time around, we're starting to see much more utility in the real world. And, and so I feel like we want to tell that story to a wider audience in a way that's easy to understand and uh, enjoyable to watch. So with that being said, because I know you said this is supposed to be educational as well, and I have no problem with influencers being in the, in, the, uh, in the documentary, right? Because the influence is definitely needed. But are you also reaching out to people like developers who are going to be able to offer expertise on the actual technicalities of the XRP ledger? That is correct, yes. We have some developers that we're working with to interview them, obviously the golden goose would be to talk to David directly. That is something that is, you know, a challenge to get Ripple to be in anything. But we are working mm -hmm. on that. And we are it working works. with developers yeah. to chat with them as well. Is this uh, are you able to speak to are you able to speak to who's funding the project? Yeah, we are funding the project. That's easy. It's completely <laughs> we, self funded. No, we're self funded, yeah. We've taken no outside capital there's one thing I learned in Hollywood is that once you take in money from anybody else, you are compromising the creative. You are doing what they want you, they, they, they whatever that party wants you to do. Lip service. Everybody who's appeared in the documentary has to sign a release that basically says, "Hey, you know, uh, we have the right to edit it, change it, do whatever we want." Um, and the only exception to that rule would probably be if we talked to Ripple directly, because obviously we wouldn't want them to feel like we would, you know, take their words out of misconstrue them or whatever. Um, and so, but, but, but we haven't taken any outside capital. We haven't taken a dime from anybody in the community. Uh, and my rule of thumb is if we are to sell anything at maximum, it would be tickets to see the film, right. Uh, it, or, uh, you know, a, a way to watch it over streaming, uh, and or something related directly to it. I would never just ask for, for funding without giving you, giving the audience or giving the person something of value in exchange. And up until this point, we have not done that at all. Are you able to speak to some of the developers that are going to be inside of the film? Not yet. I, I do. I have talked to several developers, uh, um, but because they haven't signed their releases yet, I don't want to like disclose them pre prematurely. 
Uh, but we are talking to people who are working on the XD, uh, XRPL uh, technology, a couple of other crypto technologies that are based on that. Um, and I'm, I'm always open to recommendations. If you've got recommendations you think we should be talking to, I think it's a value to hear from the community about who we should be interviewing to build the most legitimacy in the project. But it's certainly an emphasis of ours to, to have uh, core developers in there. It just hasn't been the section we've gotten to yet. We've been focusing <clears throat> on, you know, we started with influencers. Then from influencers, we moved to folks who are kind of Twitter sleuths and went into the space of ETHgate, which there's a lot of interest in that, of course. But now as we move forward in production, we will continue to pull in other individuals. Uh, developers is one group. Another group is like hedge fund managers or people like who are doing traditional finance investment. Um, you know, anybody who we feel like is going to provide legitimacy to the project. Yeah. Chris, can I add to that? Um, I just wanted to say, I think we are doing um, the best of our ability to make it more of a well-rounded project, right? And documentary where we do have different sectors um, in the space coming into the documentary, um, like the developers, like lawyers, financial advisors, you know, influencers, and, you know, hopefully Ripple themselves, we are working on that. So we do want it to be more than just about the lawsuit, right? We want it to be, talk. really, it's about educating people about, you know, hey, this is kind of the old financial system in the world and how it's transforming into this new digital era, um, tokenization, all of those things that um, are definitely coming into play with XRP's technology, so... So Maya and Chris, just off the back of that, I actually heard that you were creating or working on two documentaries, one being XRP and one being Eastgate. Are you focusing on one or are you working on both simultaneously? Right now the whole project is one project, but of, of course anybody who's been in the space for a while knows that there are a lot of rabbit holes you can go down. So currently XRP Unleashed is one big topic. We're looking at XRP as the through line. Uh, what is it? What's the technology? The court case? Why did it happen? What's the motive? Why did the SEC pick this particular entity to go after? And what's the evidence behind that? And then what do we do after that? Um, to, to, to give it the depth and the breadth, you know, we're, we're still working on the project, obviously. We're still recording. And so we kind of look at is this going to become a, a limited series? Like, are there going to be like four or five episodes so we can deep dive? And we also have to respect if we have the opportunity to bring Ripple into the project, uh, what, what, what do they want to be associated with which, or, or, and what do they not want to be associated with? So I think we have to look at that carefully. But right now, the intention is to build one comprehensive project that takes you from beginning to end, describing what this technology is in one cohesive body of work, uh, be it a you know feature-length documentary or be it a limited docu-series just based on the breadth and the depth of the information that we've gathered from everyone. And we just want to make sure we have enough run time to, to make this uh, make sense to everybody and to give everybody enough insight so that they don't feel like we've skimped on anything or skipped any valuable, valuable information that we've been provided. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Now, I still have a ton of questions, but I really want to open this up to some speakers that are on the stage. I know I've given a mic to Scams, Coach, and Chris. I, I do have one last question. Yeah, go uh, for it, Devon. So, my uh, concern is if we're going to be having a documentary out there that's talking about maybe ETHgate, it will kind of have a negative fallback on the XRP community. It'll kind of make us seem like we're just... Um, I guess, essentially bitter. So how are you going to, uh, I guess, craft a documentary that doesn't necessarily make us seem like uh, bitter exes, in a sense, right? How are you going to be able to get right. that, our viewpoint across fairly without making us having a negative connotation towards us? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to do it with class and you have to make it clear that, uh, first of all, like the last thing you want to do is make an eloquent argument and then and then end the sentence with the world is flat. Um, and apologies if there's, well, not really apologies, but if there's any flat earthers here, like 
I feel like the tinfoil hat part of it can become a problem if you go too far down the, the rabbit hole or you make it like, oh, these guys are just, you know, vengeful because they've had this lawsuit against them. The thing is, we have facts. We have Stephen Naryoff in a room telling us exactly what happened and transpired with Vitalik. We have Twitter sleuths with on-chain data showing how money was flown in and out of Ethereum at the ICO and after that. We have business ties to Jay Clayton and Bill Hinman. We have several meetings uh, that took place right before the speech and after the speech and the Dow hack and the Dow report and the Ripple lawsuit itself. I think there's a lot of facts. We have to stick to facts, right? We have to stick to information we have from the Freedom of Information Act uh, documents that were taken out and we have to lay it out in a way that makes a lot of sense. What's the motive? Why did they do this? And who is you know, who are the parties involved and what information can we provide? And, you know, we're doing that in a way nobody's angry in their interview, right? It's, it's, it's the tact that you use when discussing these topics that provide clarity. And really, it ends on a positive note. It doesn't end on a negative note. The positive note is that Judge Torres ruled this is not security for retail investors because of the effort that John Deaton did, largely. And, and also, as we move forward, all of the positive use cases for the future we don't end on ETH. Yeah. We end the documentary on this great positive journey, which is where are we going next? What is going to happen with the automatic market makers? What's going to happen with tokenization of real world assets and eventually CBDCs and the adoption of cross border payments? And I think there's a lot of positive that we're pumping into this, both from the community and from the future perspectives of developers and hedge fund managers and investors and various bodies outside of the community that have a lot of promise and prospect for the overall project. So, I mean, I, I don't think you're going to love the U.S. government or particularly Jay Clayton or Bill Hemmen after this interview, or, I mean, after this documentary, but I do think you are going to look at XRP as this friendly. exciting yeah. technology. Uh, can I say something? I actually, um, to answer your question, Devon, um, I, if anything, I think it's on the contrary uh, where, you know, where I think it is going to you know, shed light on the XRP community differently. And I think people, it's like the truth will set the, you guys free, right? I do think people are going to look at the XRP community and, uh, you know, and, and respect them um, more so uh, because this is all coming to light. And like Chris was saying, I think it, it does end on a positive note. So, Yeah. Thank you, Devon. Um, Chris or Scams, did you have any questions? Hey, we had a few. Um, my first was for Myra. I was just trying to look into both you and Chris's profile just to understand a little bit more about both of you. And I couldn't look into yours. I saw you had me blocked, um, but you and I have never interacted. Um, could you speak to that a little bit? Like, what's the reason I'm blocked? Oh, I didn't realize I had you blocked. I mean, honestly, in this space, there's a lot of ju just different people that um, are emailing me stuff. So I just assume everyone's scammers. <laughs> so I will unblock you. But yeah, the thing is, you know, that's what's scary about this space is that, you know, there are a lot of individuals that, you know, do come into your DMs that you don't know or you don't, you know, you don't know what their intentions are. So it was nothing personal. Um I just was like, most of the people I just kind of, if I don't know you or anything, it's like, ah, I'm just going to like block, yeah, or not not message back. So I apologize yeah, for no that. Problem. I've never DM'd you, but I don't usually randomly block just people on Twitter um, that I've never interacted with. But thank you for that explanation. Um, yeah, yeah. So the next question is um, about the documentary itself. So documentaries are usually um, object objective and non-biased, right? And I've just looked at the people you have lined up for it so far, and in some of your little clips and everything, and they seem to be some of the um, biggest XRP influencers who perpetrate a lot of misinformation and hopium about XRP, a lot of which they say can be debunked with facts. Are you planning on interviewing anybody on the opposite end of, of their claims and somebody who has a contrarian view to that to be a balanced documentary, or is it just all stacked with these... Uh, XRP individuals, influencers. 
You know, if Gary Gensler wants to show up on camera, I'd be more than happy to interview him, along with Jay Clayton and Bill Hinman. As far as bringing out Bitcoin maxis or Ethereum maxis, uh, like I said before, the most important thing we do is we have facts. So people can say stuff. I definitely agree with you. I'm not saying that any of the influencers that we've interviewed are misconstruing information. I'm not here to comment on what information they provided. But anything that makes the edit has to go through errors and admissions. And in order to provide an objective opinion, we do have to make sure that everything that actually makes it into the documentary can be backed up by facts. So in addition to the interviews, of course, we get primary facts. We gather information from the Freedom of Information Acts, from case files, from the developers themselves, whatever we can do to provide actual backups to, to this information. We're not going to try to allow people to change the narrative about what we're doing or just like say, oh, XRP is going to go to like $2,000. Like we don't actually want to include any price predictions, to be honest. I think it's mostly about just sticking to the information that can be verified. Um, but, you know, always open to your recommendations if you think there's somebody who actually going to speak to it. My problem is I just don't want people like trashing it, you know, because that can become just a troll fest, a waste of my time, a waste of our resources. But I can assure you that anybody that appears in the documentary, as far as what we're recording them for and what they're saying, then uh, th those are those have to be backed up by some sort of facts that they have they can provide us or or give us. Um, and in some cases, we're still making our way through production. You know, we had access to certain people; those are the people we interviewed first. And those people brought us to the next people, the next people, the next people, and so on. We don't know everybody in the space. Um, but as we grow and we find more and more, well, the goal, obviously, to get closer and closer to primary sources. And um, we invite those primary sources to be part of the project and to commentate. And if somebody from the government or ex-government people wanted to interview with us, we certainly would, would welcome that commentary. So just be, thanks, Chris. Just before we go to you, Chris Thompson, um, I, I have got a few questions. So you, you mentioned that you have a model release. What kind of model release do you have to sign to be a part of this? I mean, basically it's a release of your image. So, you know, whenever you record in an actual formal documentary, you have to have a, I have to have the permission to record you. So, you know, whatever I record... I can use that, I can edit it, I can change it, you know, I can't do anything nefarious with it, obviously, I'm not going to, like, jump cut you to make you, like, you know, say something that you didn't say, right, um, but I, I, I need permission to be able to record you, so there's just a, uh, a section on that, which is and basic, yeah. uh, and so NDA, part, and then, that, and, go ahead, sorry, yeah, an NDA, so do the influencers as part of the model release, are they receiving some sort of royalty, future rights, credits no. or compensation no. from the documentary? No. Nope. no, I mean, obviously uh, credit in terms of like their names appearing on the project and when we eventually move to IMDb, they will be credited as a person on the project. But anybody involved, nobody has been paid to be part of the project and there are no royalties involved with the project. So... There is no money exchange between us or any party. The only money exchange we would ever do would be to arrange accommodations. So if you need to fly across the country to be part of the documentary, then of course we'll take care of that. But beyond that, there is no direct payment or gifts or prizes or any sort of roundabout That's ways. That's just what you do with filming, yeah. Yeah, any, there's no roundabout. And it is commonplace in the documentary space for uh, subjects not to be paid. That is the, they're not performers. They're doing this because they want to tell their story. And so there, there is no uh, exchange between us and them, at least when it comes to anything related to their appearance. And there is no royalties in, in, in terms of that. And basically there is no money making in documentaries, just to be fair, very little. Uh, um, so it's not like there's some lump sum of money that can be won here. Okay. And, and I'm sorry, Chris, one um Final question that I have is when when I first saw you promoting um, the documentary, you said that it was going to be released on Netflix. So do you have an agent who's taking that to Netflix or is that still occurring? So there, there is no video and I've never said we were ever going to be on Netflix. Uh, there you can like 
find my clips and, and tell me where I say that. We definitely would like to be on Netflix or on Amazon or on Apple TV or on HBO or any of the number of streaming services. So the way the streaming services work in terms of distribution is we have to have the project completely together before they'll look at it. So we would assemble the entire project. We're aiming to be completed by the end of May. The, the May timeline is XRP Las Vegas. We will be there. We will be recording our final set of filming. And then after that, when we finish the assembly, we will then make that available uh, you know, for previews out to the streaming platforms. And then, yes, to answer your question, at that point, you have to work with a sales agent <clears throat> to get a meeting. You can't just like walk in and talk to Netflix or any of these streaming platforms. So they'll basically get us the meetings, help us package it, and hopefully get it onto a streaming platform of some sort. Uh, if that fails for some reason, then we'd be forced to go in a VOD model and put it on Amazon, iTunes for rental, which is not what we want to do. I think that defeats the purpose of the project. Um, so our goal is to package it for sales on Netflix uh, or another streaming platform that, that would be interested in the project. We'd also go down the film festival circuit. We're not planning to do that, but if we needed to get the attention of the streaming platforms, you could also go to film festivals. Uh, there are several credible film festivals you could take the documentary to, which would then warner uh, interest from a streaming platform, which would be another way of selling it. Um, so that there are a couple avenues out there. I think that one thing maybe I said that's been misconstrued is that we have we are recording and making the documentary up to the standard of these streaming platforms. For example, the cameras we're using, the type of quality of production that we're producing, we're following the guidelines that these streaming platforms prefer to use with approved cameras, approved codecs, uh, and so on. And, and that allows us to maintain the right level of quality, you know, resolution and so on, so that somebody can look at this and it matches everything else that appears on these various streaming platforms. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for clarifying that. So, um, Chris, thanks, Thompson. Thanks for your patience. You've got your hand up and you've obviously got a question. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, I DM'd you a contact. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of uh, Zerpinator. So we do have a, a high quality um, documentary maker on the XRPL. Send some great ones on like the XRPL Lab, oh, I've heard of that. the XRPL Foundation, and bringing Casino Coin to the XRPL. Um, so I don't know if maybe he can get you some B-roll or, or help you interview. He's in the Netherlands, and that's where a lot of the infrastructure is for the XRPL. I don't know if your documentary is just on Ripple, but they're just a single project, right? So the XRPL, F, or the XRPL um, is huge and is primarily not Ripple. So uh, if you're doing anything on the network, it'd be cool if you included what actually makes it run and not just the, the one project with their narrative. Yeah, I think that'd be great. I think if there's other people in, in the other organizations or bodies around the world, that are interested in that they would be willing to share what the, the projects they're working on and all the cool things they're doing with the, the utility really looking for that real world utility what are we solving for what are some cool projects they're doing then yeah always interested in chatting with those folks and, and yeah. seeing what you got out there i think that'd be amazing I, I think he would have he has obviously he has access to a lot of uh, the developers that you're probably struggling getting hold of yeah, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, we'll just reach out to us and see how to connect the dots. Again, it's a community-driven project, so this is a lot of how we figure out who to talk to. So, you know, a lot of times we talk to folks like you or other folks who just, they're just one degree away from another great person in the community who's who's doing something amazing. Um, it, it isn't just about Ripple's narrative, of course. Having Ripple, I think, le helps legitimize the project, but I totally appreciate that there is a wider developer community out there, and we want to support those folks. Thank you. So um, just mentioning, talking about community, I guess for me, I would like to see some more grassroots people, not just influencers, in the project um, itself. I think if you can talk to some grassroots investors and, and have them sort of featured in the documentary as well, that would probably benefit. And that's just my personal opinion, but I, I, you know, I kind of feel like that could be beneficial to um, the project and the and the documentary, you know, because the the, the influencers, um, you know, they have a massive following, 
um, I think it's good to get some people uh, in the space and I'm happy to direct you to some people that I think would be good to hear from. Um, yeah. But, um, Coach, you've got your hand up. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Coach. Hello, hello. I'm sorry. I've been having a lot of technical difficulties. Uh, thank you so much for letting me up, Queen. Uh, I'd like to say to uh, Maya and Futuristic Films uh, that I think it's a really good idea to create a documentary. A lot of people that are in the quote-unquote normie space um, are really highly susceptible to gaining information from documentaries. I actually was talking to somebody the other day that prefers to learn a lot about very specific events through documentaries. So I think that's a really good way to educate people. So my question is more so uh, to what somebody asked about. I think it was Devon that asked about um, is this going to be used as a way to, um, you know, kind of introduce and onboard more people into the digital asset industry. And so my question is, uh, what type of what type of measures are being taken to maximize on how this can be uh, palatable for someone who has no interest or even no knowledge about this space? Well, I think number one is you got to blend the line between education and entertainment, right? So it has to be made at a high production value. It has to be easy to follow. So we have to bring the background uh, of a user who doesn't have a lot of knowledge and bring them into some pretty deep stuff fairly quickly. So we do that with different explainer sections. Uh, just another part about my background, uh, what I was doing at Google was also learning and development, so adult education. Uh, I'm aware of you know adult learning theory, and so I think about how do we make sure that um, we're, we're doing a good job of captivating that person with the combination of the different types of learners, auditory, visual learners. Um, how do we make the visuals help tell the story? How do we build upon different ideas one at a time to help captivate that person? How do you create a hook that gets you in right away? Like, oh my gosh, there's like a huge world here. I don't know anything about it. What's going on here? I want to know more. And then dropping you in one piece at a time through the story and progressing to a place where you walk out of this and say, wow, I really want to know more about that. I mean, I would say, I, I mean, i got to be realistic. I can't capture everybody, right? It's, it's, I'll do the best job. We are doing the best job we can to make the most compelling and best made and most objective documentary we can with the people we have access to. And, and if there's somebody we haven't talked to yet, of course, we'd love to add them. But we also, you know, note that I think this is the awareness bucket. So you hit the nail on the head is the goal is really for those people who, are just cruising along in their streaming platform of choice and come across this documentary. Oh, what's this? This looks interesting. And, you know, yeah. a couple of hours later, walk out of it and think, wow, I really want to know more about that. I got to go do my own research. Chris, can I add to that for just a second? Um, I think this is why it is important, which we are doing in our documentary, you know, um, connecting that old, you know, financial system with the new right? And uh, uh, just to kind of shed light on what Crypto Queen was saying about, you know, adding more developers in the documentary and the space, which by the way, we are in that uh, process right now where we do have, you know, three or four that we are currently lined up to interview. Uh, some huge developers who have been working on the XRPL. Um, but I think really catching people outside the crypto space in the, you know, what you would say normal world uh, by explaining why, hey, you know, why with the banking system, why why is this failing? You know, we start with kind of the Federal Reserve, how it was created, um, why this banking system is not working, what happened with the dollar in 1971, right, when we, you know, kind of got off the gold back standard. Um, and fractional lending, we do implement kind of the old, lingo and technology uh, or the you know the old financial monetary system into the documentary and help guide them and transition them through to the new digital right with the developers with the technology and helping them better understand that in more you know simpler terms of how it works and why it benefits them later on so so would you say um I'm I'll just have one more follow-up question. I actually have a few more questions, but I don't want to take up too much time. So would you say uh, that 
the predominant intent for the film is more so education than it is, you know, kind of like a highlight reel, because I feel that um, it's very it's very difficult to entice people who have no interest in a topic um, if it can tend to cater to the people who are more familiar. Yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, it is a fine line you have to walk, right? It, it is entertainment documentaries, whether you want to argue it one way or another, are a combination of education and entertainment. It's the, you're there to learn, but if you're learning while enjoying the journey and feeling the conflict and feeling all these things, then you're going to learn more. You're going to be more engaged with the content. Um, so certainly the goal is to engage the audience regardless of where you are. And then if I'm, you know, bringing you in, maybe <laughs> watch all of it. But if you want to skip episode one and go straight to episode two, you can certainly do that where now we've brought you to a certain level of, 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 of interest. And now we're going to go down the rabbit hole further into, you know, uh, other aspects of the, of the actual um, uh, space. I don't think there's anything in the documentary that anybody here doesn't already know. I mean, to be honest with you, like everybody's already here. They're already, you know, talking with doing their own research and following their various sources. I mean, maybe you haven't seen the whole story laid out this way before, but I think for a newcomer, it's going to be, you know, 90% new information for somebody who's in the space. If you're really well read, you know, maybe it's only 10% new information, but that's the line we have to walk to be able to make sure we can captivate an audience make the story accessible because <laughs> if I put David Schwartz on there for two hours or three hours, uh, not very many people are going to watch that, right? It's a, th those people who choose to go find that information can, he's a very captivating person, but we, we have to make sure that we lay it out in a way where many voices are heard, many different perspectives are provided and that the story is laid out in a way that allows you to go one, two, three, four. Okay. Now I get this, or now I have more questions about this, which is okay. Maybe they'll come to you or come to someone else that they know, they'll go to that one family member who's in crypto and ask the question to them, you know, and, and that's at least a starting place. Thank you, Chris. Um, Mr. Fish, you have a question for Chris? Yeah, hi. Good afternoon, everybody. I appreciate giving me this time to uh, just ask a couple questions. Um, so, uh, yeah, hi, Chris. This question is for you. Um, I took a look at the uh, premiere or the preview of your upcoming documentary that you have coming out, and something that I noticed is a lot of the people that are featured in this specific documentary are people that are rumored to be paid shills when it comes to XRP and uh, Ripple. Um, and, you know, I was just wondering if you're aware of that the person that you have in these films are uh, rumored to be uh, offering money to other influencers to pump out garbage narratives to uh pretty much um kind of get the masses to be a little bit confused so when it comes to real information these specific influencers really can't be trust i mean there's a rumor about uh one of the guys that you have i think it's the big chubby guy on the phone uh jimmy valley um he was rumored to be paying a lot of influencers uh money to give out a narrative of a $30,000 XRP buyback, something with the red folder and stuff like that. So, you know, I'm not, I wouldn't blame you if you're not aware, but, um, I would just like to make that point. I just hope you're aware that the people that are going to be in this film, um, I speak for everybody when I say this, they don't represent the XRP army. Um, and they don't represent grassroots, uh, investors into this token at all um majority of the xrp army actually looks down upon these people and um i just you know if you really want to make a raw documentary something that'll really get people like really interested i recommend filming people who actually invested into the token um and aren't shitfluencers that push out garbage narratives um and with saying that i would just like to leave off with one more thing um why is this documentary something that you guys really want to put out there? Is it is it for the people who are going to be in it? Is it for their own good? Because a lot of these influencers, they just want to... They harp on this community because this community is starving for any type of information. And by harping on this community, they grow a really big following. 
and then and then after what they do is they start to just sell their own brand and they shy away from the real reason why they started a following in the first place so i was just wondering if you were aware of that and um just to give you a heads up uh majority of the people if not all in this documentary are uh paid shills in my personal opinion and um yeah i i, I hope that the documentary isn't as bad as it sounds uh thank you guys yeah so certainly i mean you made a lot of pretty strong accusations there. So I'm just going to kind of detangle those one by one. I, I think number one is that there isn't anybody who I've paid and there is nobody who has come forward and of course said that they've been paid by another person. Now I do think there's something you're talking about when you think of social media, it is sort of a slippery slope, right? So if people are trying to monetize their channels, I'm not speaking ill of anyone who's interviewed with us, but the media cycle within social media, within X, within TikTok, Instagram, you name it, particularly if you're trying to monetize your channel, it requires you to put out a lot of content. Now, that's, that's to say that some folks need to watch the integrity of what they put out there. Uh, I think when you say, you know, that they're all shills, that's, you know, a generality that you don't really have facts about. When you're talking about Jimmy Valley specifically, I think a lot of people misconstrued because I talked to him and I interviewed him directly about what that buyback meant. The buyback was never a real thing. It was never actually the intention that he thought that the U.S. government was actually going to buy back this currency or that these currency models were ever going to be, for instance, $30,000 a token, right? Under that assumption, if you've read the white paper on that, it assumes that every digital asset or every asset is basically tokenized on the XRPL, which is highly unlikely, right? There's multiple projects that do tokenization, and you're talking about all of quantum finance going over. So I think if you went to the primary source, which is the white paper, and then you actually went out to the amicus brief that was filed um, to sort of provide a motion, what he was trying to do was assess the damages that Ripple was suffering and the XRP army was suffering under the guise of the lawsuit. It was sort of a attorney's tactic in order for uh, yeah, them to, to, show, to, show the, to show the damages, right? So it was never like, oh, the U.S. government is going to do this. Now, did that happen in social tra channels? Probably. Probably people took that and instead of, which is why it's always important to do your own research, as, you know, as everyone has said here, look at the white papers and look at the intention behind those. You know, I think you have a relatively strong opinion coming in here and trying to discredit the project without really knowing anything about us. But I definitely think that this is a grassroots effort because we're just two normal people trying to tell the story, and these are the people we've access to. I certainly welcome other people in the community to, to be part of it. Um, but there is a finite amount of people we can put in the documentary as well. Um, you know, and I, I definitely see that there is this evil, which is feed the beast, which basically in my mind is I have to keep feeding social channels stuff. I'm not here to commentate on that, but what I can commentate on, like I said earlier, is that any excerpts we include from anybody's, you know, uh, commentation on this documentary, uh, th that is really a space where if they're going to be in this thing, we got to have the facts. We got to have the direct connection back to the, to the papers and uh, I, mean, I appreciate the, the feedback. Maybe I'll add that as another question, like who are you paid by <laughs> or something like that, just to kind of see if there is any behind the scenes. But so far, meeting these people and speaking with every single one of them individually, I have not seen any sort of like cohort, like sort of evil or, you know, anything other than trying to promote the XRP technology and try to make sense of what is a very complicated lawsuit and understand where are we going to go in this space. Um, so I think there's just like a lot of wild inaccuracies you just said. Yeah, I think the problem is. I, I think if you're if you're uh, if you're making excuses for their project, can you explain how tokenizing anything would have a, an impact on the value of XRP? Is that question directed at me? Yeah, I mean you're making an excuse for his paper. So if you tokenize everything, how does that have any kind of correlation to the price of XRP? I'm not here to speak about his paper one way or another. I'm just saying read the paper. Under that valuation 
model, they're assuming that the, the amount of network traffic and the amount of, you, you can dive into it. There's six different models that Vahil created. Right, but I, I, we, as a developer on the XRP, we, we don't know. Uh, it's something I read and I, I know is ridiculous. It, exactly. So if you're going to be doing any fact checking, I would hope that you would fact check that. Realize he's not. We're, we're not problem, putting that in the document. Just, just and that's so the big problem, Chris. Like every single person you have in it, like I just watched your two trailers. Not a single one of them there understands how the XRPL technology works. Like, they're all yeah. influencers who monetize, right? So, like, I think to be a fair and balanced documentary, and, and again, if you reach out to most of the big developers on the XRPL, they adamantly disagree with everything these guys have to say. So these are people actually building the technology instead of contorting the, the way the technology really works, as all these guys in your, your documentary do. So I, I, I think to be a fair and balanced objective non-biased documentary you need people who actually understand how the technology works because you said five times in this space so far the goal is to educate people and you keep going back to the technology of the xrpl but you have zero technologists in the film so far that yeah. understand what the yeah. xrpl i think that what i made clear is that we have developers that are going to be speaking so we were we are in the process the, we are building the documentary piece by piece so who did we talk to first? Of course, influencers are won't want to be in it, so that's great. I mean, I'm glad, great that we have their commentation. And then next, you know, Jimmy and John Deaton, and speaking with Stephen Naryoff, because there's a lot of Twitter sleuths and other people in the Eastgate space that want to share their story, and that's fine, and that's great too. But there isn't there is obviously another frontier, which is the developer space, which we are we have not recorded yet, but we are welcoming developers in there, and whether or not. You know, Jimmy's validation model is covered within the do documentary. That, that, that's not actually something that we're probably going to do. As I mentioned before, we're not going to give price predictions. We're not here to try to make people believe that this is going to go to 1000 2000 5000 or, or any dollar amount, $2. It doesn't matter. We're not putting dollar amounts in the documentary. What we're here to do is really tell people about what is it about, what can it do, what are its utilities, and I take the feedback. I hear you, everybody in here. It seems like this is a very pro-development space in this particular uh, X space. And I think that's, that's good feedback for us to know. And we are working with developers. And if there are developers you think that we should be adding the project, be happy to speak with them, see what their perspective is on you know, how the technology functions. I, I, I hear the feedback, and I, I'm fine with that. I think that you just have to realize that we're still in production and we're moving from one topic to the next, sort of diving through with people who speak on one area, but one area or those two areas. The reason why those trailers look like that is because that's just who we happen to interview at that time. It doesn't mean that it's reflective of the entire body of work. And actually, I'm glad that there's such passion about this because we, we do consider ourselves to be grassroots as in two individuals just making this thing. So, you know, if you feel that passionate about it, that strongly about it, I mean, obviously that means that something in those individuals rubs you the wrong way, which I, which I respect. And if that's the case, you know, then I'd love to hear who we think, you know, who you think within the development community. Another gentleman came on here a little while ago and mentioned, hey, there's somebody you should be speaking with who's doing XRPL development. And that's definitely a big part of it, along with, traditional investors and other types of spaces that helps legitimize the technology. Well, other than, other than, of course, like David and someone who works at Ripple, if you had your choice and like you could pick anyone, who would be like the top two developers on the XRPL you would like to get in the film? I mean, maybe some of us in this room can help you get them. I think we basically want to go through and look at, well, there's a couple of individuals that are responsible for the validators. So I think talking to folks who are part of the validation network that are not Ripple or Ripple Labs or the nonprofit angle, anybody outside of that would be of value to kind of talk about the amendment process of actually voting in. You know, there's been like recently, I'm sure everybody's seen like the AMM came in and then didn't come in. And having that sort of governance model to discuss the decentralized management of the actual chain would be really cool. If there's anybody who knows any of those uh, direct uh, managers of those validators would be amazing. I think anybody else in the development space who is actually building real world, you know, tools, token tools, 
or uh, assets that can be tied to something tangible would be useful. Uh, tangible, you know, like real world tokenization of assets or anything else that we feel like that, uh, that, that really is a real actual use case and not like any sort of nefarious coin or any of that. I think that's perfect. So like, so like wish list, like top two, if you could pick anyone besides someone at Ripple, like who would you like in the film from the development perspective? Like your two favorite developers in the XRPL? Well, I'm not a developer, so you would have to tell me who you think I, I should be speaking with. That is an area I do not have expertise in. I'm not you, a developer. Have, it just seems like if I was making you a have one on stage, my friend. I, I'd be researching that, right? It seems like you found all the big influencers to research. Like you nailed the top 12 of them. Let me ask you this. Is your purpose right now to agitate us, or is your purpose to actually help the project? Because if your purpose is to help the project, then you would just say, oh, well, I think these are the three or four most valuable developers mm -hmm. rather than picking my brain. So yes, there are developers I've spoken with. I don't want to, I already have one or two that are like my top choices, but outside of that, I am open to providing, like, you know, hearing what you guys think. Who are the one or two are your top choices? I can't tell you that yet because they haven't signed their papers. Oh, that's fine. I mean, you're just talking about wish list dream, like somebody would like in it. Of course you could say, who you wish was in your document, you're not saying they're in it. I would lead, lead the, let the community answer that. Maybe I'll start a poll and see who we would like, uh, who, who you guys would like, and who you feel like, who could I add to the documentary that wouldn't make you feel like I'm just trying to shill the coin? That, that's actually uh, I, what I was going to suggest. Sorry to interrupt. That's why I have my hand. Okay, I was going to say it. that you should maybe do a couple of polls. Because there's a few projects that are building, and they also have infrastructure. There's NFT projects. There's um, normal people who are just running small infrastructure. Then you have DUNL validators. You also have people like me who, you know, come from the security networking aspect. So we try to teach people about ILP protocols and all these other interoperability protocols. I think it would be beneficial for you to maybe host your own space and maybe throw some polls out there just to kind of get feedback from the community. Thank you for letting me talk, Crypto Queen. Sorry for interrupting. No, you're good, no. NYC. And Chris, I do think, I mean, that's a great point, NYC. I, I don't think people are trying to attack you, but this this is the XRP community that's come into my space, and they are asking some tough questions to you, I guess. But I think that's the feedback that you're getting from the XRP community that you have not interviewed, that you don't have represented in the documentary. So to that point, the, these people are actually trying to, I guess, create a better documentary and create more awareness for you around what you and Maya are actually creating. And I don't, I don't feel like there is anything um, wrong with them bringing this to your attention around what they're saying to you here today. So I feel like you're taking it as an attack, but I don't think it's actually attacking. They're just asking some tough questions as the XRP community. That was perfect, Courtney. Hey, Productions, I think you did a perfect job with all the facetious questions that was asked to you and how you carried it. So from me just listening in and listening out from how you carry yourself, you got my full support. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. And anyone else who's spoken up, I mean, again, uh, I, I think it's a good idea for us to poll the, uh, the community, the broader community. In fact, that so many people are very passionate about, you know, seeing developers in this. I, I think that's a great piece of feedback, and we want to include developers, um, and that's always been on our roadmap. It just hasn't. We haven't gotten to that phase yet. Yeah, that's. I think that's a good, a good thing, Chris. And like I've, you know, I wanted to learn more about it. So one of the questions I had was like, you know, having sort of um, even investors, individual investors, on there and telling that that point of view, that side of the story as well. Um, but anyway, I don't want to talk too much. I can see dignitary. She has had hand up for quite a while, has a question, and um, thanks for being patient, Dignitary. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Dignitary, Shy, Shy Town. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Chris and Maya, I appreciate you guys taking the time to kind of fill us in on um, this project of yours. I think the beauty of creating a project is conceptualizing an idea 
then incubating that idea. And throughout that gestation period, there's an excitement that takes place so that when you deliver that baby, you're completely fulfilled with, you know, the product. So what I wanted to do was kind of poke at your imaginations, both Chris and Maya, and ask, since you guys are doing this documentary, what documentaries have you seen that you've enjoyed that inspired you and had big impacts on your lives for you to go ahead and say, you know what, I want to do something like that. Thank you for your time. Oh, can I answer? Um, I, I actually just recently saw like dumb money. I don't know if anyone has seen that. Um, and also I, um, I became friends with the Dogecoin millionaire back in 2020. He invited me to, this is not financial advice premiere. There were aspects to it that I did like, um, like in regards to the cinematography. Um, however, there, there were other aspects I did not like, you know, making crypto kind of seem like it's more of a gambling, <laughs> uh, you know, area. Yeah, a gambling thing is not, I don't think, the best message as well um, either. So, um, but yeah, I've seen a few, um, what is another one, on a couple on Netflix about Bitcoin. Um, the thing is, is that... There aren't a whole lot of documentaries out there just on crypto in general. And the ones that are, there are good and bad things to it. And, you know, I think Chris and I are trying to just take the best of all of those. Um, so, I mean, just in general, it doesn't necessarily have to be a digital asset documentary. It could be anything. Oh, oh okay. I mean, as far as, as far as documentaries that I just generally like, I really love ones that pull a lot of archival footage, which is something we're trying to do, right? You have to get the voiceover in the current, but then when you can pull archival footage, that's really cool. So there's like some interesting ones. If you've seen the 2019 Apollo 11 documentary, it's basically all archival footage. There's like no interviews. That's kind of a cool uh, way of telling the story entirely from a historical standpoint. I love the documentary Man on Wire, if everyone's ever seen that, about the guys, you know, sort of like a tightrope walker across the Twin Towers. Again, another interesting situation. There's a lot of, you know, powerful Michael Moore documentaries. But one thing that I'd be clear about is that we, we're not in the documentary. I don't have, like, a, a voice in it. Like, I'm not a character in it. I don't want to be a character in it. I want it to be about the people we're chatting with and let their voices be the narrative that then pulls in you know, the individual aspects of the history or the, you know, how we got to where we are, or who, who was in the room. So the more primary sources we can get, uh, which I think is why the developer community resonates so much here, is that like, hey, if these people are in the room, they're the ones making the technology. Uh, and that's why I think the documentaries that go in that space um, are, are, are useful for that. Crypto Queen, can I follow up with two quick questions just real quick? Yeah, you go for it. You've got the floor. Thank you so much. Um, Chris, Maya, since you uh, did um, talk about, you know, the archived footage, have you guys ever considered creating a hub online to where you could have all the people in the community that have voiced some of their concerns or even some of their excitement? to deploy some of their archive footage into that hub, wherever it may be? And then the second question is, what is the most exciting thing about this project? Like, you know, that childlike excitement that you get from putting all this stuff together. Thanks again. Um, I'll answer first. I, I think that's a great idea. I don't think we have thought of that. Um, I don't know, Chris, have we? Um, so I, I would love to do that. I, I think that's a fantastic idea. And then in regards to... Just, you know, this process of making a documentary and um, thus far, it's just been amazing to see, you know, kind of the connections and how everything unfolds um, and just the excitement of, I don't know, I feel like, you know, in today's world, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of shit going on um, in today's world uh, that's just it just seems like the world's falling apart. But if anything, getting to know this information and meeting new people and connections and seeing the hope, uh, you know, kind of rise within this next generation of uh, individuals, it actually gives me more excitement and hope for the future. Um, and it's just, 
it's a it's going to be a crazy world uh, with technology and AI and all of that stuff. So I look forward to it. Um, so it's really opened my eyes to that and given me more hope. Unofficially, yeah, the the uh, we, we've everybody we've interviewed with, of course, has like sent clips. A digital asset investor had like a lot of clips because one thing he had done when he initially was like trying to put the pieces together was just finding a lot of archival clips. So that idea of doing a repository, but in like a community driven way, is like an excellent idea. I had a ton of people um, send me stuff in email, but actually just doing it out in the public. I mean, that's even that's even better. Noting that there are some like there are some limitations to how much archival footage we can use. Uh, there are like rules within documentary filmmaking that we're allowed so much time on certain clips, but, um, but yeah, I, I definitely think that's a good idea. And then to, to echo Maya's comments here, I find it exciting that as we peel the onion back, that the fact that people are challenging the, the project actually is a positive sign that there's just people who just really want it to be, you know, what they hope it to be. And I think that I align with that expectation. I might not agree with you on the first moment you're explaining something, but I definitely am reasonable in terms of like, okay, you have evidence to back this up. You know, your claim about whoever these people are or your particular, um, you know, viewpoint is valid because you, you're really coming out of it because you care about the project being something that actually speaks to the community. And I think that's the exciting and truthful. part. And truthful, yeah. So as we build it, and we move to primary sources, people who were, you know, really actually there and not just commentating on it. Uh, commentation is useful, but having folks who really know the space is valuable, you know, and we're learning along with everybody else. I was just a normal user, like many of you, a normal investor. Yeah, I knew a bit uh, more than the average person, certainly enough to invest in it, but not as much as many people know when you start getting into the weeds. And so I think it's important for us to to educate ourselves in the process, right? Learn the things we don't know, not be afraid to be like, you know what, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll find the answer to that, you know? Uh, you better believe the next interview I have, I'm going to have a list of 25 developers I want to, to have in the documentary because that's the, that's the space I'm entering into it. So, you know, I, I, I'm not embarrassed by that. I just think that uh, we want to make sure that we're doing the whole project justice and we're not wasting our own time and our own money and our own resources on it. Thank you, Chris. I, I really I have to agree with what Lip said before. The way that you're answering um, these questions is really important. And I think a valuable thing that maybe you and I have got out of this space today is that um, it, it will, it's valuable for you to include a range of viewpoints and com conflicting perspectives and diverse um, voices so that there's more of a comprehensive understanding. And again, I will reiterate that it's not an attack. I think it's about evolving um, your project and people do care. So, and I think you've come up with some good um, things like polling for the community. Someone's obviously given you um, the idea to have a public space for the community to share. Uh, you know, I think um, I'm, I'm just wishing you all the best with it. Yeah, I appreciate that. Definitely Thank be you reaching so out. Definitely be reaching out to the community. And you can always DM us on X. You can DM uh, at fruition underscore films with any ideas you might have. Of course, I'll accept your conversation, have discourse with you, and discuss, you know, whatever it is you felt passionate about. Please reach out to me, especially those who are most vocal about the uh, developer community. I'd love to hear your thoughts. What, what you think is, uh, you know, the, the most legitimate developers obviously a lot of folks know that in this space right here they feel confident you know sort of coming out and and asking you know who do we want there and i would flip the question back and do my i'll do my own research as well but flip the question back who do you want there because if you, i, I want to make sure that we do diligence and that, that the developers we have there are legitimate and that you know they're they're the ones that uh, other everybody feels like are, are building the most valuable projects uh, on the ledger and that that helps the wider audience actually understand what this thing can do and what the technology is evolving and where it's going. That was actually going to be one of the questions that I asked. Is this also going to be given airtime to the XRP Ledger projects as well, or is this going to be strictly focused on just XRP in and of itself? No, definitely a goal is to speak with the Ledger partners. Uh, I think that uh, one, one thing I mentioned early on is like the 
structure of it, getting like a longer runtime, you know, being able to do a limited series and really being able to do an episode uh, like in a limited series, you know, maybe four or five episodes and one that's just developers. Like this is the developer episode. These are all the utilities going to be on there. I think that that is a very valuable part of the project and it's something we should bring in in the later part of the documentary because I don't want to hit the audience with like too heavy of stuff in the front but definitely in the beginning we are explaining how the ledger functions we are explaining you know how the validator modes work uh we're actually recording some of that this week as we transition into the developer side of things so you know i don't take offense by yeah a lot of folks that you've seen so far they've been on sort of one side of the story and i take that criticism but i also note that we're sort of sharing these things as we complete them right and we're currently still in production and it's certainly a goal to add um, more aspects of the of the overall Ripple story outside of just, you know, people that are in ETHgate and, and uh, social influencers in the space. There's certainly other valuable stories that we want to capture and we're working on that. Literally this week we're starting to film some of that. So, um, Chris, I think your DMs are going to blow up and my DMs are going to blow up. If you haven't given um, these people <laughs> a follow, please give them a follow. And um, I just, you mentioned about May sort of um, time to, is that when you're planning to kind of release the documentary? Because you mentioned May and being at um, XRP, um, being at Las Vegas. <laughs> Yeah, so basically we're trying to treat XRP Las Vegas as the final filming date. So we're between now and then, we're filming a lot. We're filming almost every week, uh, putting together interviews and chatting with folks, traveling the country, recording, recording, recording as much as we can. And our editing team is working full-time on it. But after that point, we're trying to have the whole story constructed and bearing any sort of major developments or bearing any sort of like, you know, something earth-shattering that we need to continue to record for, try to have everything on board by that point and then um, have the project completed by the end of May so that we can uh, showcase it. And at that point, uh, you know, a couple different scenarios could take place, but obviously the goal is to make it as widely accessible, you know, into a streaming platform that a lot of people are already on anyways. So, yeah, once we talk with those streaming platforms, then obviously they'll kind of decide, you know, based in their own lineup when to release it. But I really stand by, I think this is a 2024 story, there's a lot of stuff going on this year that's very interesting uh, across this across multiple crypto spaces, not just XRP space. And so I think that that we, we it is a, like a classic case of like why this story now. I think this story needs to be released this year, uh, and I would I would really you know try to be as much as we can as a little tiny independent person making this um, story. Try to have at least. The requirement that it releases this year um but the actual release date until we have distribution until the project's done i can't tell what that will be all i can say is that we're aiming to be done by end of may so that we can package it up and bring it to those platforms and say okay here it is you know who's interested um and there's various various routes we would take past that if for some reason they weren't interested or we couldn't secure distribution so it's distribution is never like a straightforward thing especially as a first-time filmmaker, right? I'm not Martin Scorsese, <laughs> so I'm not going to get automatic splash banner on Apple TV or anything like that, but um, well, we'll try to make the best quality thing possible and, and then I'll bring that out to the world in the second half of the year. That's awesome. Thanks, Chris. So you kind of answered my question around um, the time frame and the timeline, but um, I've got a couple of questions in the audience. So I'll go to Coach, then Zeno, and Mr. Magoo. Okay, so uh, I really appreciate that you emphasized that the production was still ongoing because I feel like there was a little bit um, focus on some of the narratives as if the piece was getting ready to be released. And so my question to you is, uh, there's been a lot of talk um, just in the last you know few minutes about how there are these you know narratives and people who are paid or not paid, and then they're so my question is, <clears throat> considering that there is a very high level of sensationalism surrounding this asset with a very counter anti-sensationalism, because there's two spectrums, right? You have the people who talk about moon dates and $100,000 per token, and then you have on the opposite spectrum, the people who say that it is a high level intellectual scam and you know pretty much worthless or gas open have, have the case may be 
Um, I don't believe either of those points. So my question is, is there any um, attention going to be given to like how a lot of narratives have, you know, been circulating through the community that is essentially propping this asset up. And then also uh, those counter narratives that seem to, you know, always surround conversation and sometimes even news cycles uh, concerning this asset class. I definitely agree with you that I don't want to do uh, sensationalism, um, which is why, like, I don't want to try to put in, like, price models into this whole thing. I think price models just are... just presenting facts. That's what price I mean. models are highly speculative, you know, no matter what the inputs are. And so that, that's why it's mostly, you know... And, and, and those things change all the time, right? Something could happen two months after the documentary's done that changes the entire fabric of what we understand this to be so i don't want to you know as i follow the facts like the first thing i'd say is about the shilling piece you know if somebody had evidence of that i'd be really interested because then <laughs> then that actually changes some of my narratives and i'm not i'm not opposed to saying that like hey if you have evidence that somebody's you know being paid to, to say some stuff and, and as i said earlier i think it is a, a valid question i, I will ask these people who many of which all of which i have their personal numbers and i can be like hey what's up with this why do people say this about you? What What do you say? And of course, if anybody in the community had that, I, I like that sort of self policing energy that it seems like the community has as a whole. And then folks who are like you know strongly opposed to it, like, I, I know that there are people on either side. I think we just have to try to follow okay. primary facts, information that we can get directly from people with backed up documents. And focus that, on the technology. Just uh, yes, yeah, but backed up facts that are. Uh, ver verifiable with some form of you know, legitimacy, not just like, oh, I wrote a paper about this, and so therefore it's legitimate. Like, that's not really what we want to try to try to do. Um, and yeah, so I, you know, it's a hard line to walk. Certainly, you know, I'm, we are investors in it. Of course, what do we hope? We hope that, you know, everything is true that, that we've found thus far, that Ripple does solve the case, you know, with the SEC, and that the damages aren't that bad, the utility starts to take off and that we see price increases. I mean, that's, that's obviously we want to see that. But if I was to find something that changed the narrative, I found some piece of information that, you know, I un unrailed it the other way. I wouldn't blindly march down the path of like, this is great. I'm trying to like lead people off a cliff. I, I would go wherever the facts lead us. And that could, you know, arguably make an even more interesting documentary. But I, I think that, we, we just want to make sure we stay connected to whatever we can actually get information to. And, you know, that changes day by day based on who we're talking to. It changes just based on this conversation. Uh, and we have to make a decision about, you know, what we can present to the audience that we feel comfortable doing. And I think there will be people on either side that will always hate it no matter what we do. So I think we just try to meet the community's requirements and our own high bar of, of production quality and of integrity while doing the project. And, and feeling that, you know, we're making something that actually truthfully uh, educates the audience. But but you will not see any $30,000 uh, evaluation models in our documentary. I will I will tell you that. I'll stand by that. We won't be not, not doing that. <laughs> you, sound like a, you, sound like a, you sound like a real hardcore journalist, and I appreciate that because I'm, I'm, I'm very much aware of the sensationalism and anti-sensationalism and that type of perspective right there is exactly the things that people need. Not some extremity on either side, but just what the facts can lead you to find out. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Zeno, you're up. You got the floor. Yeah, look, the only, the only thing that matters that makes the only thing that makes XRP relevant to crypto in general is its relation to Ripple, um, and that and that's 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 simple. That's plain and simple. Uh, we've got too many people coming into this space thinking this whole five eight nine gang one world reserve currency, and there's zero evidence to support that. Looking at the the network activity and the development on the XRPL, um, it's completely non-existent, um, and just just uh, think. You know, so so the relationship to Ripple is is the number one thing. That is the biggest controversy that that makes this documentary or even the story of XRP relevant in general. 
is the fact that a lot of people are getting fooled with a lot of speculation about a one world reserve currency, and it's simply not fucking true. Right. Yeah, I mean, definitely heard a lot of that sensationalism and like, uh, it's a theory, you know, but um, we're not, we're not talking about that uh, in the documentary thus far. Actually, none of the people I, uh, we have interviewed have spoken about a global reserve currency, but I don't think I'd be comfortable putting something like that in the documentary anyways. I, I do want to be open to say, hey, there are, you know, multiple developers in the XRP uh, community that I'd be well, well welcome to hear from, but obviously there are questions that we'd love to ask Brad, we'd love to ask David about, you know, in terms of how they operate yeah, with why, why they how they allow op- that. Why they why do why do they allow that narrative to be pushed out there and they don't they don't push back on it, you know, as as much as they could have. And they could they could dispel these lies very easily, but they choose not to. You know, that that's a big question too. Um, and, and I think that's the core of, of the relationship between again Ripple and XRP. Who else yeah. to support them? I mean, if you look at Brad's following 589 people. Yeah, also, that's a question for him. Because I'm not sure how much time he got. So uh, I asked him questions for him. So he could, you know. Well, these questions are the questions that he needs to be asking, Lip. Yeah. As, as, a good, as a good investigative journalist, as as BDFs and and everybody else so claims this documentary to to be in the perspective of. Yeah, I mean, I, I do, I do have to say that. Yeah, we do have some of those own questions about how Ripple operates with its escrow. Right, there was at one point where they were like, "Oh, this is going to be fifty five months of sell off," and here we are at month like seventy something, and the escrow exists. Although you can get into like how the algorithm works and everything else. The unfortunate reality is that I know for a fact that even if we get Ripple into a room, you know, all of the questions that we ask are going to have to be scripted. That, that, that is the reality of it, right? To get a fully unscripted answer from a, a nobody like us, it's not going to happen, right? We'll, we'll, we'll try our best, obviously, to answer these questions uh, and then maybe, you know, save one loaded question for the end, just build rapport, come from a... I, I, and I come from a friendly place. I come from a place that is... I assume you have good intents for the ecosystem as you are the creators of this technology and as a business operating in a capitalist society i assume your intention is to drive the value of this asset up through utility and through development and so i have to come from that assumption but i also have to come from the assumption of is there anything that you're doing that doesn't add up to that is there anything contrary and uh you know if there's a way to word those questions carefully in a which way that a ripple would answer them that would be fantastic but we have to be careful with how we phrase things with them um, because, of course, they're going to, you know, try to control the narrative of whatever we ask them. And we'd love their participation in the documentary. We invite that storytelling. We invite them to it in a friendly manner. Uh, at the end of the day, this is doing them a lot of good and they're not paying for anything. You know, we're doing this out of our own pocket. But I definitely agree with some of the questions that have been asked here as things that we need to direct at Ripple and or you know, people who have control over those particular aspects of the of the technology. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to go to Mr. Magoo. He's been waiting so patiently. So, Mr. Magoo, you've got the floor for a question. Yes, I'd just like to try to focus a little on the personal side and ask if you're a crypto holder, and if you are, do you hold any XRP? Yeah, yes. that's, what got, that's what got us for this project. We hold XRP. Uh, and as holders of XRP, I think this is really like a manifestation of our research. You know, we want to know the truth, seek the truth, find the answers. I think the discourse is good. And if I found an answer, or I and I found an answer that led us to believe that something nefarious was going on, like I would blow the lid off that, certainly. I wouldn't be, uh, you know, I'm not here to to tell you one way or other, but based on the research I have at the moment, I feel like it's a good investment. That's not financial advice, but that's just me saying, based on all the information I have at the moment, we're holders of that. I feel very bullish on that, but I'm doing this in a way that, you know, obviously I feel like if we end up in a place where we found something that we didn't feel comfortable with, then we would have to report on what that would be. I'm not going to just blindly make it, you know, and then say, oh, yeah, this is great, even though we know all this other stuff. If we find stuff, then we're going to report that. Uh, but so, I haven't 
you know, so far we haven't seen anything. Nefarious. So you personally, you personally, you hold, yes. not not you as a company, but you personally hold XRP? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Good. Good. Yeah, yeah we, 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 we hold it. I mean, obviously, like, I think we've stated our attentions a couple times, like, in a great world, everything we hold to be true in the public sphere, you know, that Ripple says in other places, holds true. We see that as something that pans out. Hopefully, the lawsuit comes to an end. There's a reasonable settlement afterwards. And we see incredible utility, and all of us see what we think is a reasonable investment, you know, increase in value, and everybody's happy at the end of the day. That's the happy path. Right? Yeah. yeah. I wanted to just uh, piggyback off of that and say, you know, at least for Chris and I, you know, it really is, from from my point of view, is we hold XRP be, because we truly believe in the technology. It's not a matter of, you know, we want it to pump and dump, right? We're not in it for that game. We've been in the crypto space long enough to see the cycles, to understand, you know, that diversification is the best thing. You know, there are other projects as well, but we do see the value in this one. And we're committed to the vision uh, that Ripple has for XRP. So, could I also yeah, say that I think I think it would be nice to, or it would be good for y'all to state that in the documentary. Maybe start okay. off saying that. I think that would be, be that's good, good advice. For the yeah, yeah. Thank you. I, I think we want to. Yeah, we could put that in the, at the beginning. You know, and we'd have to disclose that anyways. Just like if you listen to NPR or other. Uh, radio stations, at least uh, ones that, uh, wh whatever your opinion is, the ones that are decent disclose what they're holding, right? Like, they're going to be like, hey, by the way, we hold this, or our parent company is X, Y, and Z, and we've stated from the beginning, you know, we're self-funded, it's just coming out of our own pocket, so there's no outside influence in the project, uh, other than, you know, people in the community giving us insights about wh where to go, who to talk to. That's why we started wanting to do these spaces and talking to different places. We're coming with a open hand saying, hey, like, this is where I'm at right now. This is what I don't know. Please educate me. You know, I don't know everything. Uh, and we're learning that as we go along and doing research as we go along to legitimize, you know, the process. And, and yes, we are holders and we, we hope, you know, through everything we find that it, all intentions are good and that this, this asset goes where we think it can go uh, in the future and, and, and does everything this, this community hopes that it can go to. So, uh, Crypto Queen, uh, I have a question uh, about the, the title of the documentary. I wonder if it's possible, is that finalized or is it possible to um, still considering a, a different title? Because that's really the first thing anyone will see. Is, and uh, it could be, I don't know, I don't have a suggestion right now, but it could be a, a little bit longer phrase. And also about the escrow, uh, one of the reasons it's been extended is because Ripple keeps putting the money back, put the XRP back into the escrow uh, rather than dumping it on the market. Yeah, yeah, I definitely, definitely heard that before. And, and yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything nefarious going on there. Those are just other questions that we've heard in the community, you know, questions about that or people claiming that Ripple's a Ponzi scheme. Like, I just want to, okay, so if that is your perspective, let's make sure we answer that, you know, or try to answer it in the best of our ability. Um, and, and as far as the title is concerned, it's not technically finalized. Uh, there can always be a, ta ta a tagline. I think the intention behind the title is, is with the court case coming to an end, I mean, the a large part of the community would argue that that has been one of the suppressive aspects uh, that's, that's held the asset down. So, you know, that, that title is obviously just the title and there's a larger tagline, you know, behind that. Um, but, you know, if something changed or we found different information, then that's always considerable. There's also the reality that when a streaming platform purchases this, that they rename it. And, you know, that, that, is, that is a very real thing. I have to double check, you know, when we get to that phase what what they are allowed to do and not do, but there's there's always a reality that the name could change, um, but that's kind of the the title will continue through until filming is completed, uh, unless something major shifts. 
Thank you, Chris. I've got one last hand up, so one last question, and then I'm actually going to wrap up the space. So, Emma, you're, you're up. Hi, Crypto Queen uh, and everyone. Um, hi. Um, I don't know if this question was already asked, and I was thinking about it for a second out loud, thinking if it may not apply, but actually I think it does apply. Uh, and for the sake of and in the spirit of what everybody else said, to make this a balanced and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, unbiased. Unbiased, thank you. As unbiased as possible, this documentary. Are you guys thinking or considering about including in there the, I guess, the campaign, for lack of a better word, here in America, at least uh, with uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren and the anti and the crypto ban bill? Um, yeah, that's my question. I mean, certainly if Elizabeth Warren was willing to interview with us, I think that would be interesting, <laughs> especially given that John Deaton's running against her. Uh, and while we've interviewed John Deaton um, already, and, I, and like I said, with any other uh, regulator, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, we, we would, if we could get a chance to talk to Bill Hinman or Jay Clayton directly, it's highly unlikely they will respond to our request for interview. But if we could talk to them directly, I would I would encourage that discourse. I think the hardest thing is once you go far enough down either path is that the other side doesn't always want to have that conversation. And I think that's probably what's wrong with America as a whole. Like, we don't want to have the conversations that are difficult anymore across the <laughs> aisle. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I encourage that, actually, you know, and I think it's a great idea uh, around what's going on there. It's also been interesting to see that Elizabeth Warren has been more all of a sudden pro Bitcoin. I don't know whether that was some fake information or what, but uh, since John Deaton's announced his run, but anyways, I'd always think discourse is good because it leads to uh, better results in terms of the, the overall information. But let's be real. I mean, a lot of us XRP community folks who are eager to be part of the project and, and, or, you know, raising their hands and or nominating other people. So, you know, the network kind of becomes, uh, the network of people rather becomes sort of insular a by default. So, <laughs> it, yeah, it becomes it becomes biased by itself. So that is something we have to do is kind of reach out to those people. But but I hear that, and uh, uh, you know, um, I'm open to that idea. And again, uh, I, I mean, I was just was going to add something real quick. Uh, the biggest reason why I'm asking all this, um, and again. Forgive me, I don't know how much you know or don't know or anybody else here knows. Um, but one of the biggest reasons is because, obviously, uh, one of the articles a while back, it was fact-checked. And now even the Congress has backed it up in that, uh, you know, how she was claiming that Hamas and other groups or terrorist groups and blah, blah, blah. They were using uh, crypto, you know, for their bidding. And it's at this point, it's been proven, you know, that that's not the case. If anything, that's the least uh, um, frequently used medium, you know, for black market, for lack of better terms, you know. Um, so basically, there's been a lot of lies that she's been throwing around, you know, in the country. So that, that's why I thought I, I asked about that, to what extent would you guys somehow incorporate that into documentary to put it into perspective, you know, what's happening around here behind the scenes? Yeah, it's, it's definitely a good point. I, I definitely think the number one way criminals use uh, any currency is the U.S. dollar in stacks. <laughs> so um, <laughs> outside of crypto, you know, I, I think that there's definitely some, we'll call them false narratives or negatives that are that are out there. Uh, th there's also just so much, only so much, like, space within the documentary, right? So the, right. the thing is that we can't get to every topic. I will be honest there. I, I've stood by what we said in this, is that developers are on our roadmap. Definitely somebody will talk to hedge funds and or, like, investor, like, traditional finance investors. Somebody will want to talk to. Um, Twitter sleuths and people, you know, digging out Freedom of Information Acts, people will talk to. But, um, you know, every single topic in crypto, we're not trying to take on the entire crypto industry. This is a XRB-focused thing. But I definitely see that as a headwind. But I don't think it's a narrative that is super critical, I guess, right now. Basically, because most of that has already been busted. 
that kind of feels like the Silk Road na narrative of the early days of Bitcoin. Uh, I think we're beyond that, but you correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, no, I, I, I definitely understand that. And not to go too too much into the rabbit hole, I, I know that uh, I think the modern version of Silk Road is, is falling apart as we speak anyway. Um, but uh, anyway, um, thank you for your time. Um, thank you. I, I look forward to the documentary. And if I remember this correctly, it's going to come out in Netflix, I think. Um, so <laughs> I look no. forward to that. We've actually been over that. We might need to go back to the beginning and listen. But I'll be looking for a streaming platform. In on uh, oh, okay, okay. Thank you. I will, I will say this. Okay. One plan we do have is we are we are thinking of designing a uh, a set of private screenings across the country that we put on. We are planning to to, to do something like that. And I think one thing that could be useful, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be promoting that, of course, like, saying, hey, here's these. Do you have any help with that? Yeah. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll promote those private screenings. And one thing we're going to do at all of those private screenings is we will, um, you know, collect feedback from the audience and, and say, you know, what, what was clear, what was not clear, what do you feel was unfair? Because even while those are going prior to wide release, we'll be collecting feedback about the actual project, even after it's edited. Um, to, to, to make modifications and changes. And again, not everybody will be happy. You can't like, be fully, fully democratic about it. But we want to try to do our best job to make the community proud, make a project that everybody believes in with the right production values and the right people in it. And certainly we don't want just like, you know, megaphone people uh, fall, yelling falsities as some people have claimed. I don't feel that we've done that, but I mean, certainly I, I, I do take the criticism uh, not lightly. I take it very um, personally because I want to make sure we make a great project for the wider audience and, and, and have things that are true. So I definitely stand by that integrity through and through. We want to make sure the project is solid and that we only have primary facts that we can back up. Um, and if anybody has information they want to share with me or any individuals they think we need to talk to, absolutely, within the best of our ability, we'll try to get those folks into the project.